Welcome to uh, this short talk uh, about automatization in uh, development and testing process. Uh, I would like to give a small warning that this is not going to be strictly pure academical talk. This is about getting things done, getting things done in budget, in time, helping yourself and your project uh, delivering stuff and websites. We know those. Yeah, it worked for me, but it doesn't. Oops, it's all falling apart in production. Oh. Or this one. Yeah, it kind of works almost every single time. Yeah, and this is my favorite. Uh, why not? Why not? Okay, let's let's talk about these issues. Uh, so, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is David Lucas. I work uh, in Invica, which is a, a British uh, web development company. Uh, we do all kinds of stuff, uh, PHP development, uh, Symfony, uh, Magento, and Drupal as well. It's a big part of the company and we are very proud of it. And uh, I'm actually sitting here in Slovakia and I'm Slovak, I'm just talking in English, not get confused. Um, throughout my career, uh, I've met really various sizes of the projects. I worked for large companies on projects that scaled in months and years where you really had the luxury to do test-driven development and write unit tests for every single class that you have in your code base. But I also worked uh, in much smaller companies with projects that scaled even days or weeks and you had small teams of two, three, five people. And then the, the project started growing up uh, and get more complicated and then you realize that you are getting into more trouble as you go through that and you need some view into what's happening uh, on your project and why is the uh, quality de uh, declining or something like that. Uh, in in Invica we do mid-size projects, so it's still not there that you would really have time for everything, testing forever, you have to fit into project, but the projects are complex enough that uh, you need to worry about, uh, about the quality of the code and of the output. Um, so, uh, I will start with a couple of questions for you, and then we'll see if we just close the session because you know everything and I don't have nothing to tell you. So we'll see. Who is using features on your Drupal projects? Yeah, features, great, almost everyone. Uh, for those who don't, it's a mostly Drupal 7 thing now. In Drupal 8, it's going to be changing. But if you have Drupal 7 projects, look into that. It's exporting configuration into code and managing things via code. Our life is going to be much easier with Drupal 8. But that's for another topic. Who is using Git and other version control system? Great, fantastic. I'm very glad that we don't even have to go through that step. Who is using, using Drush and Drupal console in next? Okay, almost everyone as well. That's very good. Uh, who has any kind of QA automation? Any tests that are happening? Yeah, very good. And uh, who is in the point that uh, you have a proper continuous integration or continuous uh, delivery system set up? Okay, some people, great, fantastic. So, yeah, automated tests. Hopefully not, hopefully not, after today. Okay, so why would we like to automate anything, right? It's saving us a huge amount of time. If you have a task that you need to uh, run five times a day or three times a week, it doesn't matter. You are running a task that's you're repeating yourself. You, you have to 
switch from other work that you are uh, at the moment doing or the tech lead on the project have to be interrupted to do some kind of deployment uh, uh, deploy to test server for new from new uh, branch that's uh, that has been just done uh, you are losing efficiency if you, you don't automate your time is being wasted or your developers time or your testers time uh, because things are being repeated manually and since we are humans we do mistakes in that process even especially if we have to do any kind of tasks that are being repeated we just lose that touch of detail and just hoops and then something happens in production not good and frankly yeah that was what was that about industrial revolution we, we found out that we are not good at repeating process machines are much much better at that uh, so we would like to automate we need to figure out what and how so smarter people uh, than me have figured out these things like continuous integration continuous delivery so let's 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 just quickly take a look at that before we go to the to the practical part uh, so first, what's a, what's a continuous integration? Who can give me a one sentence of what's a continuous integration? Continuous integration is some kind of software engineering practice of merging separate branches of streams of, of work into the main stream, uh, which is happening often ideally several times a day and these changes are being immediately tested and the issues with these changes are being immediately reported yeah uh, and the goal of this of, of doing continuous integration is getting feedback of what's happening in your code base if you, you are introducing some some uh, mistakes if there are some bugs something like that uh, and these mistakes can be quickly corrected you don't find out after half year in production that uh, the VAT calculator is one percent off oops that's not good uh, and going forward uh, there is not much to go from continuous integration to continuous delivery so what continuous delivery uh, says is that um, all these changes or all, all these cycles are happening in short time often yeah. and the goal of them is to find out releaseability of your software is that current build that that last commit that went into your repository is that code releasable to production and again to find that out you have to run some automated tests you need to have some scripts in place that will push that code somewhere something will happen and you either get a green light or no nope, we do another iteration yeah so the goal is to build release and test your software often fast and frequently so you always know what's the state so these are all nice technical reasons and our technical people will understand that but what about our customers and, and our bosses the management why would they care about continuous integration continuous delivery um, so th the reasons I'm uh, finding for that uh, is that we need to know whether the business critical functionality of the software whether it's a small website or a huge information system whether the critical functionality is working correctly so what's the critical functionality right the critical functionality can be for a simple website that the home page is actually there and showing up and it's not totally broken or if the users need to log in then and that, that's it and they see some information and the critical functionality of that particular piece of the software is ability of the users 
to log in. For uh, e-commerce websites, it's placing product into the cart and going through the, uh, through the purchase process. Um, you also need to know whether you are breaking something that you have already done or fixed before. You don't want uh, your tester or uh, maybe in smaller projects when the manager is testing and clicking through the sites. You don't want them to be doing that over and over again if it was done before. So you don't want to have regression issues. Uh, and for me, this is very important for me when we do deployments to production, I don't want to have butterflies in my stomach evening before the morning production that, ooh, did we really think of that? Oh, I forgot that. Ooh, well, I have to put that in the script. I, I don't want to have that. And I'm sure that most of you don't want to be nervous before going to production. And I want to be able to go to the manager, to the customer, or whoever the stakeholder is that, yeah, sure, tomorrow we are going to production, no problems, everything is taken care of, scripts are in place, database backup is, will automatically be done, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this builds trust. It builds trust, trust between in the team of the developers. It builds trust uh, from developer development team to, to the management. They know that we will deliver. And it will it be, uh, builds trust for the customer, that the customer is not nervous what's, about what's happening. But yeah, still the budget, still how much time is that going to take? <sighs> okay. Before we go into what we can quickly do, there are some prerequisites, and there are not many. One thing, Josh, most of the hands went up, who didn't look it up. Um, it's important to have unified Josh aliases. Small little technical detail, every single developer's Josh aliases on the team has to be the same. Why? Because you need to write a script, and that script will need to work with Josh aliases, and they have to be the same. Or you can do some uh, aliasing of the aliases, but well, they are called aliases for the reason. So that's one thing. So uh, that's not really visible. So it says my site dot local, my site dot stage my site dot UAT or whatever testing environment you have, my site dot production. You have one set of aliases for one project, one website, and all the developers have these aliases distributed, put them in the code base. Uh, the last line is linking the aliases file into the uh, user's home folder. That's very easy one. Or Drush will look up the aliases in uh, the root of the Drupal folder or in the sites folder or in the sp specific sites folder in the sites folder. <laughs> yeah, there are three places Josh will look up for the aliases. Linking to the, to the home folder is the easiest one. And you can put that into the initialization script of the project. So it's just there once and that's it. Committed into Git. Everyone has the same aliases. All the developers have the same aliases. So if one developers, developer goes on vacation and you need to get a dump of the database, any of your developers can just run the same script to get the dump of the database. And all the other scripts that would need the aliases. Uh, I would strongly, strongly recommend having one unified development environment. I'm not going to recommend that this is the best one. There was a session right before me uh, that Adam gave on Docker. Go for it. Docker is great. We are having some issues with it, <laughs> but it's great. Uh, yeah, so Dev Desktop is one of the options. It's from Acquia. It works well. It's pretty fast. It doesn't matter. Just agree on one of the options. Another one is uh, 
uh, Drupal VM. It's uh, Vagrant, an Ansible-based uh, virtual machine with solar memcache and the whole list, list, uh, rest of the stack. So it will solve most of your uh, problems. Very well supported uh, by the Girling guy. I always forget his first name. Um, yeah, and the dimension docker as well. So it will again very much help your team to, to get the processes unified and it's one step towards automat automatization of those processes. Uh, Git flow. Who's using Git flow? Who is using Git flow properly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've seen many people saying you, that they are using Gitflow, but they were just actually using the names of the branches that Gitflow defines. <laughs> and that's not really going to help you. So if you are using source tree or tower or something like that, use that button that gives the Gitflow functionality because it will be doing it as you are supposed to be doing. And when you know that, yeah, sometimes I need to make a branch from release branch and the button doesn't make that, I'll just branch manually. But I know that I'm keeping with Gitflow. I'm not saying that Gitflow doesn't have issues and you can go much further. You can forget all branches and using just develop. And uh, there is, huge uh, initiative around no branches at all, but start with Gitflow. If, if, you, are, if you have mess in the repository, it's a good place to start. Um, so we have set up some common ground. We have the threshold access, which means that we have the site working locally, or we have some uh, remote servers. We have some common uh, working environment, and we have uh, some sensible workflow around the, the code. Now we can go automating. So, yeah, shell, it sounds less exciting than we thought it would. <laughs> but yeah, it's shell <laughs> is one of the places that's, that's being either forgotten or Maybe people are a bit afraid of it. It's a great place to, to start your automatization processes. Uh, so, every single deployment in Drupal, what it means? Clearing all the caches, running database updates, and running cron. It's probably every single deployment that you are doing with whatever Drupal site, you need to do these three tasks. So that's your first script, deploy, whatever. And if you can see, or probably not, there's <laughs> the, <laughs> the one parameter coming into this, the script. So it's my site, alias, has the parameter of $1, which is the first argument coming to the script. So you just create one script, deploy, and then you run it on, on your uh, terminal, deploy UAT. And it will work with those aliases that we defined before. And suddenly from running three commands for each of the environment, you get one script and you can do loop for all the environments. Suddenly you have something that's happening automatically. Oh, what's the next step? Purging the varnish. If you are using varnish, well, that's, again, your testers will probably kill you if you don't purge varnish. It's, uh, the presentation will be shared, so don't worry about it. The um, snippets are widely copied from various code bases. So they are purely for informational purposes. They don't work as they are displayed. They need some stuff around them. So, well, obviously, you need to replace at least the names of the aliases. Um, going further, it's, it adds to the deployment. So it's, it's additional step to the deployment. 
FRA dash Y, that means feature revert all, who works with features knows that if you put this into your deploy script, the project manager who little bit knows Drupal and wants to uh, hit the target with the client will never go into Drupal login and do something manually without you knowing it because it will be overridden immediately. So you suddenly uh, have installation working purely through the code, through the features, because you have automation, and automation requires that there is no human element poking here and there and randomly over there. So you don't want to be happening. So this is one of the crucial points in Drupal development. If you're doing Drupal 7, this particular point, if you don't have it, it's almost impossible to, to automate around the site. Um, R sync, SQL sync, getting the files, getting the database copy. So you can have, we have scripts regularly like pull from stage. And any developer doesn't need to know anything about anything of that site. If they check out the code base and have some company credentials, which they usually do, pull from stage and it will get the fresh copy of the database, get fresh copy of the files, and they can work locally. It's huge, huge help uh, in the onboarding process. Uh, and obviously running some tests, so I have just example of of uh, BHAT being run. Uh, other tasks, Jim, how am I doing with, uh, with time? <laughs> okay. Um, so any other kinds of tasks? So uh, setting up migrations, uh, handling solar, deleting solar index, re-indexing. So if you use solar, you probably need to do something like this after each single uh, deployment as well. Uh, deployment scripts. What I've started doing recently on projects is having like, if you keep GitHub, a uh, GitFlow, you know that it will produce a tag at the end of the deployment. So I've started doing scripts for that particular tag in the the code base that will turn on the feature, turn off the feature, set some variable, uh, clear some of the caches, not everything, because that's not ideal in high traffic sites in production, uh, maybe run, whatever you need to do. So as, as soon as you start automating things, you'll realize that there is plenty of opportunities that you can be doing. Uh, and that's, as I mentioned, uh, environment set up for new team, new members of uh, of the team, like yeah, running the front end stuff. I never know what's what's happening there. Just run some npm bundle install whatever. Uh, some helper scripts like enabling and disabling uh, development related modules. Uh, so, for example, it's, we are using uh, Acquia hosting quite much, which supports hooks, which are happening at some points in, in deployments, but you can do something similar on other servers that you have. Uh, so, in those hooks, in production environment, we always have, like, disabled devil when you deploy to production. If even somebody would go in manually turn on devil, just turn it off. As soon as some deployment action happens every single time in production, it's not supposed to be turned on in production. Yeah. And uh, I also have some scripts uh, usually for doing the whole build of, of the application, like uh, making sure that all the dependencies from NPM and Ruby are installed and afterwards compiling the uh, CSS assets, bumping up version in some application properties file, and uh, uh, automatically committing that into repository and triggering the deployment script. 
So the shell command seems quite, quite rough, but they are very easy to write, very easy to start with. Don't, don't be afraid of them. And they can be very helpful. And they'll give you very good basis uh, on automating these things further on in, uh, in continuous integration tools when they are running on the server. So you'll ha already have, have them. And they'll give you very good view of what's not automated in, in the project. So you'll suddenly see those spaces that, oh, I still have to do this place manually or I have to do this manually. Uh, just to quickly mention for front-end uh, tasks, you're probably already using if you are if you are having some uh, SCSS and stuff like that. So compiling the front-end assets. Okay, so that was some some first steps, first basics. So let's go into something a little bit more advanced, not in sense of complexity, but who knows uh, Laravel as the framework probably. Yeah, everyone, and this particular tool, Envoy? No? Okay, so Envoy is a simple automation tool. It's part of Laravel framework, but it doesn't mean that you can just use it out of the box. Um, First thing, first difference between what we talked uh, until now about these scripts, which can be run locally, Laravel Envoy tasks are run remotely on the server. They are not running locally. They'll need to SSH into the server and run, uh, run remotely. So uh, installation, composer, global require, Envoy, Envoy in it, and you have some first basis of that. And what's very important is in, in especially in Slovakia, is that it works, for example, with web support as well, so we can use it. I'm using it for my personal blog, like just switch branch, pull, clear the caches. That's it. Uh, so you don't need, really need to have um, some virtual machines or, or dedicated hardware, you just need to be able to SSH into the, your environment. Uh, Laravel introduces a couple of concepts uh, like variables, so you can pass some arguments uh, to, to the tasks that you want to be running. Uh, you have to define some servers, so you can have some different like, development server, UAT server, production server. So you set up those, which are I'll show in, in a second. And then you have uh, tasks which we want to run on those servers. And then you can group those tasks into like macros, which will basically run sequence of, of the tasks. And you can do some preparation, some setup uh, at the beginning of the whole of the whole run. Uh, so this is quite disappointing especially for the huge blue area around. So reading the code, that's a great one. Okay, so we are defining some server which is called S1, which has a user. So it's like SSH into a server. So that's what the task will perform at the beginning. Then we have some setup where, where we define two variables, which is current. It's just for demonstration purposes, uh, current uh, timestamp and current environment. And in the actual task, which we say it's called deploy-prod on server, which is run on server one, do some change directory, print something, uh, run some drush commands, switch the branch, pull the last changes, run some, some additional uh, drush commands, and 
for demonstration, I created a macro deploy which will run some non-existing additional cleanup uh, task as well. Okay. So as you can see, it's very, very simple. And then you run it like Envoy, run, deploy prod, that's it. And suddenly those local scripts you had running in, in shell can move them here and you can run them on various servers, various environments without really any kind of knowledge of anything. This is like what you do every single day. It's nothing special about it. Uh, I'll mention Capistrano here, which is very similar concept, much more complex. Uh, you need to know Ruby a bit and you need to be a bit familiar, familiar with the Rake uh, domain language. But in concepts, it's very similar to, to Envoy. So if you want to play around, this probably will blow your budget if you don't know it yet. <laughs> but it's definitely worth uh, playing around uh, if you are running sites and applications on servers, like not on shared hostings, but on normal, regular servers. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'll say, and we have too much ground to cover, um, that you already can automate a huge amount of things in your workflow. Notice that we don't have any testing yet, so I'll get to that. But at this point, you can grab a free code chip subscription, which runs like 100 builds uh, a month, and plug these scripts in, and suddenly things will start happening, like uh, for example, we have simple scripts that uh, when somebody is merging a pull request, the script will trigger code ship, it will compile the assets and push them somewhere. So suddenly tech lead doesn't have to go in after doing some changes by other members of the team and, and deploying, which is just damn stupid task being repeated over and over three, four, five, five times a day. And uh, so, yeah, you can already automate. At this point, I can recommend uh, this repository on GitHub. It will give you a list of free tools that you can use, you can play around, and then you can ditch them or start paying for them, whatever. There is a huge amount of, of uh, free tools on the internet that you can use, and this report is famous for it for the list of them. Okay, so uh, testing. Uh, so notice that I went the other way around. So the academics tells us that we need to do the testing first and TDD actually tells you that you cannot change any single line of code unless you are doing it to <laughs> they need to fix a failing test, but we are living in the real world, and I would be very glad working in, in, the, in the manners that uh, it was created, but sometimes it's just not possible, and yet still there are options uh, how to improve the process greatly, even if it will not if it, not, uh, if it won't fit the ac academical standard or the standard you would like to have. I'm, it doesn't, call, me calling it academical doesn't mean that I think it's something we can just discard. It's not, it's, it's very valid, but it still will be better having anything than nothing saying that, oh, we cannot live up to that high standard and we won't be doing nothing about quality and automation. <sighs> yeah. So that's what I just talked about. And frankly, I know that many small projects which are in the weeks, the, if we take a look at it from, from return of investment point of view, we know that the site is going to be done writing every writing a, a unit test for every single class, well, I'll leave that to you. But 
at this point, I would like to mention that if you have any space, and it's maybe not that as much space as you would like to have for uh, single class testing and unit testing, this tool, it's a lovely tool, not doing advertising it because it was written by the guys in our company, completely unrelated. It's, <laughs> it's uh, a great tool for uh, modeling your uh, domain objects and classes and testing their behavior at the same time. So you don't have to go into depth of unit testing, but you are still testing the behavior of uh, the classes that you're So if you have any applications that are, for example, based on some on uh, Symfony or Laravel or frame from, framework like that, uh, it's a great option. So how you can do testing in budget without unit tests? Behead. Who knows Behead? Yeah, 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 yeah. Some great. Okay. Uh, so Behead is another framework that was completely, again, in, unrelated, written by some guys uh, in our company. <laughs> but it is, um, uh, frankly saying, it's um, wildly uh, accepted tool for behavioral testing. So on, on the websites that we are developing, many times what's more important than one unit test is the overall uh, behavior of the application. Um, and now we are getting back to that critical functionality. So you need to test, you don't need to test everything. You need to test whether you can place that, uh, that uh, shoes into the cart, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, it's a great tool for gathering requirements uh, from the client or from the stakeholder that you are working for. And why is that? Is because you write the tests in form of user stories, in form of Gherkin. If you are familiar with that, with, with Gherkin, you're writing tests like that. And again, um, academical people will tell you that you are not supposed to be writing uh, BDD tests in that fashion, but yeah, whatever. If your critical functionality is whether the uh, homepage is actually accessible for, for uh, the visitors, sure, create a scenario that's saying, uh, where do I have it? I'll be skipping a bit ahead. Da -da -da. User can see main header, and user should be able to see text. Welcome to our site. That's it. That that's your test. So this is Gherkin language capturing some behavioral requirements of your software, and you can run tests against this. And you don't have to actually write too much code as well, because Gherkin uh, Behead comes um, with Drupal support. So this is some setup file, don't mind that. Uh, and for the test, the only line of code that you would write is that uh, uh, that selector that would tell us whether the subheading is there or not. And it will test your application. It will run. It will run uh, the, the browser. You won't see it, but trust me, it will run the browser. And it will scan the HTML structure of, of uh, uh, the output from, from the browser. And it will check for existence of HTML elements. So you can check whether some button exists. You can check if it's clickable. You can click that button. So you can behave like a user would. And the Drupal support gives you options like support for uh, the, the messages that come out from Drupal, Drupal said message. You can log in, log out the user, and a huge amount of things without even writing any test code. Um, For example, this is great thing if you are doing 
uh, mo uh, module updates, cover your website with a couple of tests like this, run the updates, run the test, and see if the structure, the menu is still there. Yeah, there are five elements in the menu on the home page. There is another test creating of an article. Okay, this will probably require a couple of lines of code, uh, but again, it's just very, very easy to write. And if you are using um, PHP Storm, it has a support for uh, for Gherkin, for Behead. And those sentences will be actually be auto-completed for you. So you write then, and you already, already see list of suggestions. I should see this, I shouldn't see this. And you just fill in what you should see and what you shouldn't see. Right? And then you will see some output when you run it. It's green, then it's good. If it's red, not so much. Another uh, tool, and this is actually first tool which is paid, and I'm not doing advertisement for them. It's not developed by our company. <laughs> we are using it extensively though. Uh, Ghost Inspector is a tool for automating UI testing and uh, UI monitoring. So automate what's happening with your with your front end and how the site looks because that's many times the only specification we get from the customer. So we want it to look like this. We don't know what should happen when we click here and there and over there. Designer put their five buttons, but it should look like this. Um, so what, what this tool does, it uh, creates screenshots of your application and then it will compare the screenshots as you go over time. And uh, some basic test has just one thing in the test and that's just capturing one specific page. Now, I don't recommend that this is the way how you should use, use it, but it's the minimal way to use it. So it will check some specific URL on your, let's say, testing environment, and then it will give you output. So on the left side, it's how it looked in the previous iteration. It really doesn't matter what the website is. I think it's IKEA, IKEA site. And on the right side, you can see a sea of red. And the sea of red is the change that's happened on the visual from the previous iteration. So if you make security updates on the site, which is the one of the scariest thing, or maybe for someone not, but then I'm not sure if you realize what's happening when you update 25 modules on the site, nothing should change, right? So for situations like that, I have tests covering most of the site, running the updates, and then I fire them up. I mean, everything should look as it was before. Nothing should change. And if something changes, so if you have a sprint which should add five buttons, then you should see them in the test. Oh, there are five of those red buttons that I have added. Uh, in the last iteration, and then you say, say, okay, I accept this change, and this is going to be a new basis for, uh, for the next iteration. So it's very simple. You need zero technical knowledge for this. Literally, you can, uh, in one of my previous companies, the project manager was the actual tester who just was nagging developers, is it done, is it done, is it done? When he got yes, then he went to the site and clicking through the site frantically and something was happening. And this was happening every single day, many times with those same changes. So with this, you can help yourself very much. Um, it has a plugin for Chrome, which can record your actions. So you just click through the site, click through the process. So for example, that uh, e-commerce process, at the end, you should get a confirmation that a uh, user bought a product, it will capture that screen, and it will run the same user actions you did before. Uh, and it will even uh, actually record a video of how it's happening, so you can see a flow of the application uh, afterwards. Of course, it has an API, so lovely thing. 
curl some specific address and it will tri trigger all the uh, tests for that site that you have previously defined. And you can either parse the JSON output from, from this call or you can have it uh, hooked somewhere into your CI or GitHub or whatever giving you a green light or, or red light. Have the test passed or not? And the steps that I mentioned bef before, so you can define, like, click on this, click on that, do this, do that, fill in this, so you can test like user login as well. It will record, so we need to do some security measures so that you don't give it a production password, but hey. Uh, so yeah, that's the ghost inspector. Not that bad, probably. 79 dollars would be enough for, for most of the teams here. Okay, so to recap, we want to save our time. We want to be effective. We want to increase uh, the quality. We want to build the confidence of the team, confidence of, of the tech lead, uh, confidence uh, of the delivery team, and we want to build trust between each other and management and uh, the customer. To do that, we need to automate, and we or we want to automate, at least I do, and to effectively automate, we want to have a unified environment and means of work, how we do it. Uh, so we can set up some automated tasks and automated quality checks. And while that's all running, you can go have a table tennis session with a colleague next to you, grab a coffee, and you still be done earlier than previously when you would have done it all manually. So that's, I think, all from me. If you would like to give any feedback, I'll appreciate that very much. Uh, and if you have any questions or additions to, uh, to this, now it's, now the, it's your time. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we've been doing that, uh, that a bit. Uh, both Behat and Ghost Inspector, I think, are using Selenium, so it's wrapped in a bit more uh, higher level of, of abstraction. But yeah, that's one of the, the great tools as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a uh, uh, particular experience with that, so I, I cannot say. But uh, I not the whole point is to grab any tools that work work for you. So if you have understanding of something uh, in the team that works for you, absolutely go for it. Uh, this is something that we've, we've done recently. We've gathered some experience, some confidence around, and it worked for us. But it, it's, it's not supposed to be any kind of ultimate guide. It's just options. I think the most important part is, is the very beginning one, the, the common ground to, make, to be able to make the automation happen properly. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a good choice. Uh, I was playing uh, around that a bit. Didn't get too far, didn't have a need because I had already had uh, other tools in place. But definitely, as other people in, in uh, our company are using, uh, using it to, to automate other than server deployment and server management tasks, definitely, yes. Depends, again, depends uh, who else knows Ansible on the team as well, so if you are not around. So for me, the main point is come into the team uh, from my position of, of, of uh, consultancy, set things up, and the team can run them those things for themselves. So if, you always know that if it's a particular person that needs to be around to some, make something happen, then the setup is not good. 
you want to spread the, the knowledge, you have to, that's why the GOP task. I know nothing about front end. I know nothing about how, I mean, yeah, I know how to compile SCSS files, but what, what if there is something else that needs to happen before that, that should, I don't know, just give me a task, put, in, put it in the script, and I'll run it, make a documentation out of it, so anyone in the team can build and deploy, why not? your application to production. If all the tests passed, anyone in the team can, can do the deployment.